Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. I want to welcome uh, everyone to our um, Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology Thursday conference. And um, this week uh, we have an out-of-town visitor. And um, uh, so we try to uh, advertise a little more broadly. And I'm always glad when um, I see faces that I don't recognize. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bill Hurt. And I'm chair of uh, DMIS, the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology. And um, for the past uh, couple days, uh, we've had a, a visitor in town, um, Dr. Howard Silverman, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, who, is, um, who shares with a number of us uh, a great interest in um, how you uh, teach informatics to clinicians, um, which is something that um, many of us who our professionals in informatics, even if we're not necessarily physicians, uh, will teach. And of course, there are other um, clinicians besides physicians that uh, need to know how to learn, um, uh, need to learn informatics and the tools, uh, particularly electronic health records. And um, Howard and his department, his group um, at the University of Arizona um, have been uh, among the leaders um, in this area. We also have some visitors uh, from I won't mention the city. It's uh, that they played in a basketball game last night. <laughs> um, who are also here and uh, uh, visiting with um, some other folks. So this is a big week for um, informatics instruction for medical students. Um, anyways, um, let me uh, uh, briefly introduce Howard. Not, don't want to uh, uh, kick into his time too much. So w one thing I do want to um, ask people: um, for those of you who are um, not familiar with this room. When you ask a question, you need to hold down the little uh, button on the microphone in front of you, mainly so the people who are listening to the recording, or since we also stream these things, so there could be millions of people out there in cyberspace watching this. Uh, we, we actually do get a decent audience um, uh, so they can hear the question, although Howard will paraphrase it. Anyways, um, so um, uh, Howard is um, a professor and chair uh, of the Department of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix, where he's also a professor in departments of family and community medicine and bioethics and medical humanism. Uh, previously, um, he was associate dean for information resources and technology at um, the University of Arizona College of Medicine. He also has some uh, previous ex experience, uh, system director of medical informatics and clinical, clinical innovation at Banner Health. Howard graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Purdue University, majoring in mathematics and German. And then he earned a master's degree in computer science from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he specialized in artificial intelligence applications and medical decision making. He then went to medical school at Stanford University School of Medicine and did a residency in family practice at Good Samaritan Medical Center in Phoenix. So I will let Howard take it away. Okay, thanks, Bill. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, I want to invite you to you know, keep this interactive as possible. I have done this more of a lecture than an interactive session. But uh, please interrupt me as we go along if you have comments or questions, testimony, challenges. Uh, and I, hopefully it'll be of some interest to see how, what, what, what we've uh, experienced over the last couple of years. Also, I want to just chuck a shout out to Dr. Teisinger, who 20 years ago was my instructor in pedagogy, so we're going to, this is like my final exam, you know, <laughs> you're going to see if I learned anything. Uh, okay, so it's nice to have all of you here and uh, look forward to your comments and input. So um, I have to figure out how to position. There we go. Okay, so this is the purpose of the talk, you know, maybe we should write that spot down. The idea is, you know, like we've had uh, for various reasons, serendipitous and otherwise, a whole lot of experience now trying to figure out how to teach medical students about medical informatics. So I'm not sure we know where the spot is exactly, but we at least know where the woolly mammoth is, and that's what I'm hoping to transmit today to some degree. Okay, so I wanted to give you a sense of, just very briefly, a sense of context. So uh, we are a new, relatively new four-year campus that grew out of a regional campus in Phoenix. So the College of Medicine in Tucson, accredited in 1967, has been sending their, uh, about 40 of their third and fourth year students for their entire third and fourth years in Phoenix for years, for 20 years. 
because we have a gazonga huge amount of hospitals in Phoenix, big, big town. Very high quality community-based residency programs in which those students rotate along with uh, physicians in the community as appropriate. Uh, so we were started as a kind of, a, I would say, a partnership. Some people called it a, a shotgun marriage between two state universities that were traditional competitors. And the way the marriage worked was that uh, Arizona State University, which was located in Phoenix and is a big university, was given funds to start something that would be relevant for the new medical school. Michael Crow, who's the president of that university, worked at Columbia with Ted Shortliff, grandpa, one of the grandpas in informatics. He understood the importance of biomedical informatics. He had a strong computer science and engineering department. So they created a new biomedical informatics department. Uh, and I was involved 50-50 on the medical school side and this new department. The new department setting up very much like the department here to grant master's degree programs, PhDs. The idea is the faculty then would teach informatics to the medical students. And so that was kind of the, the context. Uh, the new curriculum involved uh, four sanctioned themes, which meant that we had rights to claim time in a reasonable and civilized way throughout all elements of the curriculum, which we have done. And these were the four, informatics along with ethics, public health, and behavioral sciences. So this put informatics on the map. You know, we started, our curriculum when we started was a blank piece, piece of paper. And it's just a whole lot easier to work in these kinds of new materials in that context. I know I was involved yesterday with Dr. Gorman. You know, you guys are doing curricular reformation, so hopefully some of this input can be used as part of that effort. Uh, the LCME did not like this model. They started out saying, yeah, the new medical schools that are now forming in the United States should be kind of tagged along with some sort of parent campus, and that's how we started under joint accreditation. They realized that model doesn't work because you can never keep the two campuses equivalent. So they asked us actually to apply for separate accreditation, which we did and received in last summer. So our 80 students that came in last summer are on a, a new curriculum. So we have done two complete new curriculums in seven years, and we now have two medical schools that are running as the second year students work their way out through the pipeline, right? So it's been interesting. Okay, uh, this is impossible to read, but I just want to give you the visual. So the, basically, the, one of the major features in the new curriculum is students start clerkships in early April instead of summer. That was one of the purposes. But it has implications because it means the basic science has to be compressed. Um, now, there is going to be at least uh, we hear that there's a unicorn who's going to ride in with a little this on the point of his of his horn, but you know we're looking to populate some basic science into the clinical year. It's not clear how that's going to happen because currently the students at the advancing edge of the students is just in their first year. Now this has implications for informatics in the curriculum because of this accelerated basic science. Basically, the criteria is if it's on step one, we need to teach it in the, in the pre clerkship. That's a pretty narrow criteria. I think it's not that strict. Obviously, we need to teach other things from clinical skills, you know, patient communication, other things. But we've argued successfully that the criteria should be it's on step one or they need it before they start clerkships. And we have a pretty good case to justify the need for certain aspects of informatics training before they start clerkships. However, it's not, there are no informatics questions on the board. And if I had a magic wand and could do one thing to change the landscape, I'd put informatics on the board because that would give every single medical school uh, a chance to uh, populate that material into the, somewhere, presumably, basic science in appropriate ways. Okay. Okay, so I think this group, I don't have to go over these uh, points too much. Why biomedical informatics? Um, it's just, it's happening, right? And everybody, in, I, I don't know, we were talking about this last night. It used to be that they'd say, what is that again? Now people know what it is. They know that they're producing wads of data they don't know what to do with. They know they need clinical decision support. They are getting um, more accountability for safety and quality of the care rendered, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think, I don't think the use case or the pitching biomedical informatics is nearly as hard as it used to be. The question facing me was, how do I create this curriculum? Uh, so I figured I'd call somebody who's already doing it, find out what they're doing. Turned out there wasn't anybody. I couldn't find anybody anywhere. If you ask, actually, there are surveys of medical schools, and a substantial portion report teaching biomedical informatics. But when you ask them, what are you teaching, it's PubMed searching, which is an important part of information literacy. But that's not biomedical informatics, right, as far as I'm concerned. So we kind of had to make it up from scratch. 
Um, okay, so here's, here's kind of the historically what we did. We took, uh, oh yeah, so we published a complete description of what I'm telling you now in academic medicine. I, I'll, I'll give you the reference. Uh, we made sure that people understood BMI is not the same thing as information literacy. And in fact, in our school, we formulated information literacy objectives and packaged those, and we have an uh, interdisciplinary group that teaches those. So we have public health people, we have informaticians, we have librarians and so on who teach that stuff. Um, as I said, we were unable to identify any curricular requirements for the MBME or anywhere else. So that was good and bad, right? It was great because we could teach whatever we wanted and call it informatics, but it was a little troubling because we had no anchor. If you're teaching physiology, you go out to MBME, you see the list of what you got to teach. As if you do that, you're halfway home. Um, okay, so not included on MBME. And LCME has no standards directly to informatics. They have some about information literacy, but that's about it. I couldn't find anybody else that offered uh, content other than information literacy, as I said. So, what do you do? Suggestions. Wing it, yeah. To be more specific. <laughs> I'm curious, I mean, I don't expect, you're not curricular designers, that's not your thing, but, but what, how would you, how, what, are you, what are your thoughts? How would you approach it? Uh, integrate use of uh, informatics tools as part of other curriculum items. Good. So. Uh, this is, I was describing this yesterday, the cotton in the class, right? Instead of asking for a separate glass of water, you just put your cotton in the class and it doesn't take up that much space. Go out and figure out what problems are new doctors, like doctors entering the entering profession facing yeah. due to their lack of biomedical informatics knowledge. You know, what specific things do they need to know how to, how to do that they aren't able to do or they have having problems with doing and figure out how to fit that in the curriculum, right? So going out and doing some kind of needs assessment both real time in medical school, but targeting their practice lifestyle. Okay, and those are great suggestions. And we, we did uh, that, but we also started with one other thing. We looked around for any kind of standards we could find. As I said, there were none in the traditional medical school arenas, but there was one document that actually was quite good, which was the 1998 Medical Student Outcomes Project. So the AAMC created learning objectives and implementation strategies for a variety of different areas, and they had done this in informatics. So we're in 2004, 2005, we're figuring seven years old in the land of informatics is a long time, especially during that period. Technology and techniques have changed. We looked at that and actually, as we revised it, I had anticipated we might do like a wholesale revision. It really was about 80% of it was still highly relevant. There wasn't much about mobile computing. We added that point of care decision making and stuff like that, but it was actually very good. So we looked through that. Um, we developed our learning objectives, what would now might be called competencies. And um, we also looked at the core competencies that the AMIA had put out, and we did kind of a crosswalk just to see, are there any big gaps? Just like, is it the best calibration check we could think of? We kind of tweaked it a little bit more and came up with essentially a list of objectives. But as you know, learning objectives not the same thing as an interaction with a student. We had to figure like, that's, the, that's the, maybe the what, the aspirational what, we had to figure out how. There's another problem with medical students. That's why I was wondering if there are any medical students in the crowd. But for better and for worse, medical students have a binary sort on what's important. If it's on the boards, it's important. If it's not, I don't care. I mean, it's really very, very uh, amazing. And some of the more mature ones do realize that there's something after step one called clerkships, residency, a career in medicine, right? But that's like, yeah. But they also know that you know, they're not going to get the great residency if they don't do well on step one. So there's a lot of pressure on them about that. So we also had to kind of figure out how to motivate them to think that this was worthwhile doing about. Okay, so we took those learning objectives. We mapped those to our institutional program objectives. We decided to cluster them into topics, and I actually used Ted Shortless's uh, book to do that, because he has kind of a nice taxonomy of chapters in his book. It was as good as anything we could find just to kind of organize it. Then we had to lay out the teaching sessions across all four years, where we have to actually specifically, where are we going to teach what, and how many hours are we going to use for each topic. So this you can't read, but this is just a page out of that list of learning objectives. This happens to be informatics competencies. I chose this page. It's a little more relevant than the information literacy one. And you'll see, you know, kind of very familiar things. A lot of this came out of the MSO paper. So now we had a, a foundational document where we could say, Here's what informatics is. That was important to communicate to other faculty and obviously start to build the educational machinery for the students. Um, 
This was the topic list, which was quite long. By the way, this was way overkill. I mean, this, is, this is a really complicated way to do it, but we had some time on our hands. And since it was an unknown space, we wanted to be uh, reasonably rigorous. It was, it's easy to simplify, but, but generally you think this is how it works. It diverges and then it converges. Okay, then um, we went through and we took all of the uh, sections, the specific topics, learning objectives key to that list you just saw, and specifically where it was going to be taught. Knowing the sequencing of these blocks, I showed you that color diagram, those are system blocks. I know that the MBLD block comes right before the neurologic science block. So as I assign topics, I sequence the instruction in addition to making sure that everything's covered. And um, the question was, how much time do we need for each of these? And so Doug Fritzma, who at, at the time was uh, at ASU, MD, PhD, who many of you know, is a fabulous guy. Uh, we actually sat down, I was telling you guys this earlier, we sat down for a half an hour break during one of the AMIA meetings, and we just arbitrarily assigned all these hours. We were curious, are we going to have 500 hours? Are we going to have four hours? I mean, we needed to calibrate. We wound up with 93 hours that we thought ideally would work. We, in the long run, now currently have about 45 to 50 hours, which is probably about right. Um, and as you were saying, we're trying to kind of fold, or somebody mentioned, we're trying to fold stuff into existing curricular elements, which I'll talk about a little bit, so that we're not actually needing more time, we're just needing to be more clever about how we do the instruction. Okay, so this was pretty complicated. Uh, so then it came to the motivation part for the students, right? How do, we, how do we motivate the students? And so I put this slide up in my intro talk to them, basically to say, this is not what we're doing. You know, this is every physician's nightmare, guidelines and all that kind of stuff. You're going to clinical decision support is going to auto-manage my patients, and we're not trying to do that. What we, what, we, what we keep saying them over and over and over is what we're trying to do is to enable informed automation, things like clinical decision support, to decrease the cognitive load on the physician or clinician. So they have time to attend to the human things that we do uniquely well, which is complex decision-making, communication, all that kind of stuff. That's the goal. Um, also, to respond to this growing movement, to share data, to be able to share data, understand how to do that, at least conceptually, you know, share data with others as you would have them share it with you, the golden rule of data, if you will. And uh, ultimately, really what it's about is quality, safety, and efficiency. Right? So what we're, in the end, we're not interested in teaching you stuff because it's something that we like to talk about. We're interested in having you in a position where you can help ensure that patients are not killed for the wrong reason, which happens, as we know, in the United States. So uh, just to paraphrase, would we mark it as a new specialty choice because of the new clinical subspecialty? Uh, the problem is it didn't exist in 2005, right? So we, we would tell students about careers in informatics, like types of things that clinicians could be involved in. And some were really interested. The new clinical subspecialty is probably not a validator for students of this content, but for those who are interested, it's a much more defined career trajectory. And it was a big investment for students to do what you're doing. If you're a medical student, you take three to five years to go do a master's or PhD. You know, in informatics is a big opportunity cost for them as they're racking up lots of other educational loans. So the presence of the clinical subspecialty in many ways allows them to, to make that decision a little later and to actually at least get some kind of salary while they're doing that instead of paying tuition. But at the time, it was uh, not our case. And frankly, there weren't a lot of formally trained clinical informaticians around. They're, they're around, but a lot of people were, on, you know, docs that were on the job trained or nurses or pharmacists or whatever. Yeah, it's a good thought. It's a very good thought. Um, okay. So what happened was we then, about two years after we launched this in 2007, around 2009-ish, we basically needed to review every aspect of the curriculum. Right? We had a brand new medical school, brand new curriculum. We went through a methodical, uh, rigorous evaluation of the curriculum. Um, and we wondered, how has this been received? Um, and especially the people that are not into it. You know, the people that are into it, it's easy to convince them. Um, and we continue to struggle with how do we make the value case? Because 
None of our sessions are mandatory. Well, very few are mandatory. There are some that usually involve labs or external speakers or whatever. So in some cases, you know, students just didn't show up. And the students are, medical students, probably all students, are very clever. They figure out, I can miss, you know, if, if I'm in my block that's nine weeks long and there are six sessions on informatics, I can get all those questions wrong. I'm still going to pass my exam. So there's not really a negative consequence, direct negative consequence to them if they don't attend. So it's, it's a tough one. Um, and what's the core focus of the instruction based on that? Who should teach it and how? So these were questions we continued to struggle with. This is an iterative process. We had made some progress, but we continue to struggle with this. Um, OK, so and before I get into this, so the other thing that happened was we arbitrarily put, in addition to the informatic sessions that were peppered through all the first three years, we also had two blocks which were, in our case, one-week blocks, which meant you got a grade for that as a course. If you failed that, there were big implications. And uh, we could completely control the 19 hours of instructional time during those weeks. So it was essentially like a deep dive into informatics. The initial uh, blocks were placed at the beginning of each year. The amount of thought that went into that was the big zero. It was like, hey, we'll, let's put the, we'll put them in the beginning of the year. Right, then we'll start them off right. So what happened was the students come in, they're just ready to go, right? They've been waiting for how many thousands of years to get to medical school. First week, it's prologue. It's kind of a you know, getting to know you kind of thing where they learn the systems and all that kind of stuff. Then they hit biomedical informatics. <laughs> and there's this big thudding sound. Now, now, the good news is students in their second week in medical school are so pumped up on adrenaline that they're, they're like, Ugh. <laughs> So they're totally, they were showing up in the whole bit. But it was obvious that. It was obvious that this wasn't a good thing, right? And we, at the time, we didn't really have much content. We were kind of, what is this whole thing? We were delivering like a mobile skills, you know, we're doing point of care decisions that they were going on in clinical settings. But more importantly, there was a problem with assessments because in a one-week block, it's really hard. I mean, the students get, like I said, a grade, and if you fail two courses in medical school, you're out. So if they failed that one-week block, it was the equivalent of failing a 12-week block, and it really just wasn't right. So eventually, part of the redesign was getting rid of the short block. Just not because they didn't want informatics. It was just that sense of the difficulties in assessment and evaluation. Well, that's such a short block. The content was preserved, but we did redesign it substantially. So really, we wanted to do a redesign that was time neutral. And um, the field is, is definitely changing. So we're continuously revising. New tools are coming online, both educational tools, clinical tools, informatics tools. Uh, and again, you know, mindful of this role I mentioned earlier about quality, safety, and efficiency. So we, while we wanted them to expose them to all of the four subdisciplines of informatics, and we do, so they do uh, sessions on bioinformatics, they do sessions on imaging informatics, and population informatics. Largely, as you can imagine, we're really interested in the clinical application field, and we really are increasingly interested in skill acquisition, particularly uh, use of the EHR, which we were talking about. This colleagues in San Antonio. So uh, that's been some of the shift in the curriculum. OK. So now what I'm going to talk about, you know, I'm going to get into this redesign. So we wanted a hands-on uh, lab rather than talking about EHRs, we wanted students to be using EHRs on the EHR side. And we needed to figure out how do we develop assessment methods and how do we hybridize with other curricular elements. This is the cognitive class, right? How do we use what's already going on and insert ourselves in, in a useful way? Uh, we just had a new building built. We, had, uh, we have gorgeous learning studios. I was describing these yesterday. These are uh, big rooms with uh, well, there's three that seat 60 and one that seats 140. So picture a room like this with uh, five tables on each side and an LCD screen at each table so that the tables can do table exercises. And then those screens can be slaved to a laptop at the table or to the instructor PC or any of those screens can be broadcast to all the other screens. So this opens up the opportunity to do some interesting lab. Right? So we wanted to leverage that space uh, we really want to put content in the clinical years, but there's a problem with clinical years, which is that you 
have to do it seven times. We have seven rotational cycles in the clinical year. So if you're going to insert something, you better have faculty who are willing to do it seven times per year. It's not insurmountable, but also the clerkships themselves have huge amounts of stuff that they're trying to cover. So there, it's actually a lot harder to get uh, new content in there unless it serves the needs of the clerkship. So that's tricky everywhere. Uh, we want to expand the use of community-based faculty, which the presence of the department now is really greatly helping by bringing folks in. There are um, huge healthcare systems in Phoenix. There's the Phoenix VA, which you're all hearing about in the news. Actually, I asked my colleagues there if they found the list, and they said they're still looking for it, but they, they can't find the list. I don't know what that means. Uh, so the Phoenix VA, Banner Health, which has 25 hospitals. Uh, Dignity Health IT Operations is centered in Phoenix. They have 43 hospitals. We're talking about like hundreds of hospitals and informaticians of all stripes that are working. So we need to bring those people in. And we really want to move more into what uh, is a very rapidly growing field of consumer health informatics and CHRs, as well as all the big data, big data mining and all that kind of stuff. Now that may or may not be useful for the medical students, but as a uh, campus, that's, that's a big interest. Um, now, what we did, we have a curricular tagging system. So we have two librarians that go through every single teaching session and apply a set of uh, tags. Uh, we experimented with UMLS tags. We decided we liked, we actually created our own tagging system. And, and largely, this is for curricular accreditation purposes. So these tags were selected because there is some specific LCD standard that says, tell us where you teach about X. So we need to know where X is in the curriculum. What was surprising to me was I went through and tagged uh, just pulled uh, biomedical informatics. And a lot of these sessions, I have no idea what they're teaching. So this now works both ways, right? We're trying to get curricular time. But the other really critical thing is we want to be sure that other faculty are not teaching informatics covertly. And I don't mean that in a negative way, you know? I mean, but that they're not, and, and we found this frequently, that they would put out a session and it would have some informatics content. Might or might not be properly sequenced. Might or might not be accurate or complete. And usually, actually I can't even say usually, always when we approach them and say, so, you know, we look at the PowerPoints, we say, would you like a little help with this? And they say, yeah, absolutely, I don't know what I'm doing, you know. So it's a friendly conversation. So this is what we call kind of scope creep, where the theme directors would meet with the block directors and course directors to get our material into their blocks properly contextualized, but also to find out what else they're doing that uh, might be a problem. This was actually much more prevalent, as you might imagine, public health than it was in um, I don't know, culturing and laboratory diagnosis are bacteria. I don't know what they're teaching in informatics here. So, so this was another important thing as you guys undergo the curricular reform or in any other school as well, to have some reasonable checks and balances about um, other people that are not necessarily on your faculty teaching that work. So this is not unique to informatics, as I said. Um, this is a list of what we came up with for the, what I would call now old curriculum. This is last year. Uh, that was actually, as you can see, kind of a four-year thing. The, let me just translate a little bit. Um, transitions is, is a two-week block between basic science and clerkships. Intercessions are uh, one week, usually one or two-week blocks in the clinical years where they have uh, the ability to come back to campus as a group and be taught clinically relevant basic science, uh, which includes, so we have time there. We do a fair amount of safety and quality uh, stuff there. Um, We've developed some interesting prescription writing workshops in using EPIC with pharmacy students, where the students are prescribing, but they have a, a senior pharmacy students that are helping them figure out what to do. It's, 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 it's been very interesting. OK, so let me pause for a second before I get to version 3, 3.0, which is now where we're going in the new curriculum. And this is, there's a lot of hanging wires here for this. We're still figuring out. But I just want to pause for a second and kind of trap any comments and questions. Yeah, so um, uh, we've had this discussion, but I'd uh, be interested to have you share it with the group. Um, you know, we, we've we been trying to do this at OHSU. I, I was put on the curriculum committee in the mid-1990s um, by the dean saying, do this. And, and the response I got from most of the faculty was, yeah, this stuff is important, but not in my course or not in my clerkship. And um, um, actually, the one good outcome is that we turned our attention to graduate education and developed our, our program here. So the, the world might have been different if we had been successful. But I'm curious what kind of um, 
um, reception you got, what, you know, what the politics was, um, and whether maybe you've seen it change over the years, which I, I think we're seeing it change here now. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, I mentioned that earlier, it's definitely, people are more, more interested in informatic and are, are getting a sense for its role in healthcare. Uh, we were lucky, I mean, I, I, th I was lucky, because even though I wandered into a situation where I didn't know what in the world I would do, uh, it was a new medical school, so there was, there was no, I didn't have to take hours from somebody to teach my stuff. So that's a unique circumstance that you get maybe if you're lucky once in a lifetime. But the other thing, though, frankly, is our dean was a rabid supporter of informatics. And uh, maybe rabid's a little too strong, but a strong supporter, right? He wasn't actually fooling, but he was uh, and, and I don't know why, because he's not an informatician, he's a pathologist, he, he has no particular knowledge of informatics. But he's a forward-thinking guy, and I, he, he attends every single applicant orientation. So when applicants come to campus for their interviews, he does a one-hour shtick, like, welcome to the campus, here's our campus, and he covers all this stuff. And when he gets to those themes that's in the curriculum, and I've heard him say this on numerous occasions, he'll say to the applicant, so biomedical informatics, I'm not sure what it is, but I'll guarantee you it's going to be more important than your stethoscope in your practice lifetime. So that's, you know, kind of it. So when you, when you have the, someone at the top, that's really helpful. It's not, it's not going to do everything, right? Because you still have faculty to work with, but it sure helps a lot to have high-level kind of support. But um, I think also because we were, you know, again, unique circumstances. We were small. The faculty was relatively small. Uh, there was a lot more communal, barn-building kind of feeling of people. We would, and the other thing is that we often would help them do things that they couldn't figure out how to do in their block. So what happened when the theme directors would meet with the block director? we would get into some really creative uh, examples of how we might take a topic that they need to teach or want to teach and just kind of twist a little bit so it might be more interactive. Um, one of the things that happened, for example, is we do these case cases every week. And by the end of the first year, the students have gamed this. They know that the, you know all they need to harvest out of that opening activity is learning objectives. So they're very devious and efficient at milking those learning objectives out of the facilitator. And by second year, it's kind of a joke. It's just like, why don't you just give it to us? It'll waste two hours on it. So, you know, what we're proposing, we did a pilot with one of the block directors where we put the case into the EHR, a lot like Fran's doing, and put a little spin on it where the students had to go into the HR to get the case information instead of on a PowerPoint. The students kind of got really interested all of a sudden. So, you know, looking for those kinds of opportunities to not compete for time, but actually work together collaboratively, figure out how can we take this up to another level in terms of that was another thing that really worked well. It's kind of hard to figure out where those are, but when you when you get the conversation started, things things happen. Yeah, Paul. Uh, I, thanks for this, Howard. I've got an implementation question. Um, you mentioned teaching stuff too early before they're kind of ready for it, and I've had that experience the first couple of weeks. It's like, why are you telling me this? So the issue is, um, have you had experience and do you have a view on whether to sort of plant the seed, like you're going to be seeing this later, and then it might take a year before they do, versus just leaving it alone and when they need it, delivering it at the time? Yeah, it's a really good question because the way I always kind of joke about it is you can prepare steak really well, but when you give it to a one-month-old baby, you know, it's not really, <laughs> they're not going to really like it that much, you know? It's got to have teeth. So, so that was, in addition to the motivation question, the idea of how should this be sequenced and at what point, at what point, it's a developmental thing for medical students because they go through the four years, right? So. At what point do you give them what? And then how do you sequence all that? So initially, we sequenced it largely based on the block. So if we were in neurologic sciences, we we're trying to think about, do we talk about neural nets or something like that? That absolutely didn't work. So when we redid this in 19, uh, whatever it was, uh, I'm sorry, it was about 2008, 2009, what we did is we basically figured out, here's, here's the, the universe of what we want to teach them about informatics and here's how it should be sequenced from an informatics point of view what makes sense so it's let's just take it at a great a highly you know high level non granular level we want to teach them about data in their first year because that tees up the conversation about decisions which we teach them about in their second year clinical decision support and if you understand about data you can understand a little bit more about electronic records right because it's a big database etc so there was a natural kind of sequencing of informatics topics. So we quit trying to figure out how to link it all to the block, and we sequenced it in a, in a, to address the question you're, you're talking about. 
start small, then increment, increment, and, and we were listening to students and other faculty. And the other faculty came to us and said, you gotta teach this earlier, because I'm teaching such and such, it would be really helpful if they had that. And um, that worked much better. And then we would bolt it to the block in some way or another. We would find a connection to the block. So as an example, if we're teaching data, uh, we talked about this yesterday a little bit. We're teaching the students, what is a database? What is data? What's a data schema? And of course, they're like, Phew. but um, fortunately, they all have to do a required scholarly project. So in the back of their mind, they know, I might get a data set. I should probably pay attention to this stuff. Uh, so we did that, but we wanted to contextualize it in a clinical context. So since that happened to fall in the neurologic science block based on the sequencing, we uh, used a neurologic condition. We used something, because I was talking to you about that yesterday. So we just, and actually then the block director got really excited because that's one less thing she has to work into her lectures is Huntington's. Students learned it at a deep level, not because they had a couple lectures on Huntington's, but because they had to learn that like on the fly to get to the schema formulation and so on. So it's really tricky to figure out how to sequence. And I, I, I just can't, there's just no right way to do it. So it's a matter of experimentation. And it has also to do with what your resources are, where your strengths are, and what your vision is about the key things that you want them to learn. We do want them to understand about data. And we want, at the end, the other thing in addition to that non-cookbook, the safety, quality, efficiency, we want them to be informed consumers of key products as, cl as clinicians. They need to be able to feel like they could talk with a developer in some reasonably intelligent way to say, I know there's a better way to do this as a CMO. I know there must be some place, or I know there must be a better point of care decision making tool or whatever it might be. So, so it is tough, and you're right. It, the sequencing is really important. And frankly, this is an N equals one experiment because no one, I don't, I'm not aware of any methodical ways in which this has been done with medical students. There is no universal medical student curriculum. And even if you establish the competencies, that still doesn't tell you how to actually roll it out. You know, in the old days it was program, clear screen, call program one, <laughs> program one, say hello, call program two. Then all of a sudden it was time for a coffee break because, you know, Having that sequencing in mind is, I think, helpful. So like my, my feeling would be for you as informaticians to think through, especially those of you with clinical background, to think through the what, and then think about the sequencing, which largely you've done in a lot of your online work, and then then figure out how to, how to actually kind of compile that onto the existing curriculum. So it's not independent, but it's integrated into that existing curriculum, and actually serves the Other comments? Questions? Okay, so I'll just tell you where we're kind of going. And I want to credit Sumya Panchanathan, who, uh, Sumya's a pediatrician who was actually in the first group of students that went through the ASU BMI master's program. By far, my best student. And I was thrilled when she came back around and said, gee, I'd love to help you teach the informatics curriculum. So she now is, has taken over the senior director position for me as of last year or two. And it's really moving this whole thing forward very rapidly. So I really have to give her a lot of credit. Um, okay, so uh, for those of you that you know speak medical school or residency jargon, friends, you go, oh yeah, these are the competencies. Actually, foundational is not, but these are the six holy competencies across all medical education, frankly, extending into practice now. And we've listed our wording of these. Uh, this is, I think, system-based practice. So the idea was let's let's now really align the instruction with competencies. This is kind of I think what you were you know what you sent me last night, and then uh, this is like as I said wires hanging kind of thought piece. So there's red is implemented and green is like we're in the process of redesigning. So if we look at these competencies, uh, I won't go through these one by one, and I'm happy to you know provide some PowerPoint. But this basically is how we're starting to think more and more. But one of the things you notice is in addition to the specific uh, competency, actually, the competency has those big, big buckets. These are probably a little bit more learning objectives. We're starting to lay them out where they should, where they should be. Um, EHR boot camp, for example, CCE is clinical continuity experience. It starts in August of their first year. And we got feedback from the faculty in that part of the curriculum that they wanted the students EHR enabled before they came to them. So we do this now. Uh, we teach them significant EHR stuff uh, in month one of medical school. And 
uh, it's actually worked out well because that's when their excited period is. So they're actually paying attention, you know, before their attention span goes to like that of a nap. Um, so anyway, what we've done is we've layered these out into specific blocks in each of these. Uh, and then I can run through all these uh, just briefly. But this, this one, I have another slide after this. So one of the things that, uh, that people here in San Antonio have been working on and I was surprised. I thought we were the only ones interested in it, but it turns out there's an explosion of, well, not explosion, there's a tiny geyser of interest, is this uh, issue of teaching the students the communication skills and um, almost physical skills about how to use the electronic record in room as a relationship enhancing tool. And so we've been doing a lot of work on that. Um, as a valuable adjunct to communicate with the patient, not just in a clinical uh, sense, but in a relationship sense. So I snuck in a slide of the study we did where we uh, took existing sessions that were in our clinical skills uh, curriculum where the students every other week come in and uh, have to interview standardized patients and are assessed and they're not really graded because it's all formative, but there's a very granular checklist that the attendings, the faculty check and the standardized patients, the actors who they're seeing have a communication checklist, and, and the students themselves have checklists. So it's an ideal setting to gather data. And we brought in Epic and put the patient's data, actually vital signs and meds only, to make it simple. And just said to the students, you must check vital signs and meds on the computer with, you know, as part of your encounter. And the uh, dotted line on the bottom, that's all we said. We showed them how to use Epic. We gave them a two-hour Epic initiation. The beginning of their sessions, we said, remember, vital signs, meds, click, 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 here's how you get to them. That's all we did. And the top solid bar were the group where we gave them actual instruction about how do you introduce the computer into the encounter, what do you say to the patient, how do you position yourself and the computer relative to the patient, how do you signal when you're going to be doing something on the computer versus not, and so on and so forth. And um, these three rows are standardized patients on the bottom, faculty, and students. And the first thing that obviously pops out at you is there's a big difference between these two groups, right? And it's P less than 0.01. So there are three things that came out of this study. One is, I'm sure there are no medical students in the crowd, right? No, the one is that uh, digital natives are not good at this. So the fact that they understand how to, and are very comfortable using computers, in no way influenced their ability to do anything uh, that was communication enhancing with the computer with patients. So we verified that this is a learned skill. Secondly, that's the second, right? You see the improvement, right? So we verified that with training, which consisted of three 15-minute sessions just prior to them seeing the patient over these, these doctoring sessions. So we boiled that down to about 20, it takes about 20 minutes to do this, to produce this effect. That's the second conclusion. So this is an example of the kind of things that, and actually when we did this, we, the faculty, we, we as faculty had a big discussion about whether it was ethical to have a control group that was not getting the training. So we decided the ethical approach to this was to train everybody baseline on Epic, so at least they had the navigation skills. But it's just like a new drug. We, didn't, we thought it, you know, it could equally be harmful. We didn't know. Now that we know that it works, we have really good data about that. Now it's the standard. You know, it's just rolled out to everybody. So uh, did you have a comment or question? <laughs> button, button, button. I'm a med student. OK. All right. So you'll keep me honest here if I'm exaggerating. I'm not actually. I was a medical student. I'm not criticizing medical students. It's, it's a. It's just the way it is. It's you know. It's the reality of their lives. Okay. So this was just out yesterday. So I was really proud of it. You know. So I just couldn't help but slide it in at the last minute. Uh, and moving along. Uh, on and on and on. Right. Can I ask you an e yeah. EHR question? So. Um, um, well, actually, th this city is rapidly um, becoming a monopoly for one particular vendor, but that isn't always the case. And, um, and of course, even within that one system, you can have uh, very different um, screens and so forth. Um, did, did, you have, did you address the issue of, of you know, kind of um, what you would show them in the first year and what systems might, of course, the technology even itself may change by the time they get into their third year, fourth year, and beyond? Yeah, so it's a good it's a good question. We we know that our students go to so many hospitals that they're getting exposed to almost every EHR that that exists. 
certainly in Phoenix, there are big uh, Cerner shops and big Epic shops. So we know they're getting those too, and they're in some cases getting some test centers and some other systems. So they do get that during the clerkship. Our problem was we just couldn't get access to anything other than Epic. And the reason we got access to the Epic training instance was the county hospital, with whom we have an affiliation, uh, did a big bang go live in their hospital. So they had seven training systems that were whirring and grinding 24 seven. And once they got past their big bang go live, they decommissioned those, all but two for maintenance. And we were actually assuming it was smart enough to say that if we have one of those five that we're gonna decommission, they said, sure. So we, we all of a sudden magically had access to that. And we're in the midst of getting access to Cerner. We think we need to have more than one. But on the other hand, and I have no data to, to, to validate this assumption, I have this feeling, like I, I think we talked about this before, that it's like a car once you, you know, once you learn how to drive a car, you get into another car, you know there's gotta be a steering wheel somewhere, you know there's gotta be a brake, gas. Uh, it's, yeah. So like a stick, once it's a little funky. So, so it'd be ideal to have them exposed to more than one system. It's just that the getting that arranged has been logistically difficult. But I think we're well on the path to getting Cerner and Epic, which, which would give us some robustness. In that figure, it seemed like most of the things that you were that you were describing in the orientation were not like this button is over here and that button is over there, except for the, the same thing that both groups got, right? Most of it was sort of soft skills about how to use the technology in a more kind of meta way. Yeah. And I would, I would expect a lot of that support between the HRs. Oh, yeah. I, well, you know, they, um, the quality, whatever that means, of the implementation clearly impacts your ability as a clinician to use it fluidly. But, you know, that it, it's, it's like beauty. It's kind of hard. You know when you see it, but it's a little hard to know prospectively how to manufacture it. So there's no question that some systems will produce lift and more lift than drag and some the other way around. What also is fascinating as we've rolled that training out to residents at, at the grand rounds is that, and we've done it with attending physicians, the same phenomenon occurs in every group, which is there's usually a spectrum of comfort and capacity in the group itself. And so there's always one person who says, I do it all after my shift because I, I don't want to have the computer in the room. And then you have the other person that says, oh yeah, well I just rigged some templates up, I'm good, I get 80% so really, we feel like our most important contribution in these trainings is to have those people identify each other and go off somewhere and get coffee and talk. Usually there's intrinsic expertise in the group, it's just not shared. One of the things we try to emphasize in our one-on-one um, uh, -on -one feedback session with students is that if you can adapt these skills now, you might have the chance of having a hobby and a life so that you're not yeah, doing all exactly. your charging <laughs> afterwards. Exactly. And so the quality of life is you're able to in, uh, have the cotton in the jar as opposed to pepper. Right, right, absolutely. And we all know that the veracity, the accuracy of clinical charting at the end of a shift when you've seen, been in your specialty, maybe 20 patients, it's pretty marginal. Now, obviously, people take notes. They do whatever they do to help themselves remember things. But it's just not as good as doing real-time charting. Plus, you miss the advantage of actually enhancing the relationship if you're doing it right, where it's actually better than when you're doing paper, right? Because you can swivel the thing around and show patients their meds and say, is this list correct? Or they can even show them their labs or an x-ray or whatever you might have on tap. So patients really love it. And, and I was mentioned a couple people that had experienced during the last phase of the study, the standardized patients were begging me to call their physicians, their personal physicians, to please instruct them you know, as soon as possible on this because uh, you, they said, I know it's a fake encounter with a medical student, but this is great. <laughs> so, and Howard, we, yeah. we've had the same results. Our students who do these scenarios and cases out in the community, the docs that they're working with are like, can you come out and teach our, yeah. us how to do this stuff? Yeah, it's interesting. And actually, we, we tell the students, please feel free to share this with your preceptor. Plus, they, you know, they, they're witnessing what other people are doing, and they kind of get the delta. Okay, so this is just a lot. Actually, I put this in here more just to kind of leave it behind, but more about all these different types of uh, curricular planning and professionalism. We're still working on, um, although we do we know we have to talk about privacy and security. So there's a lot. These are newer areas that we're building out, though, that are interesting. So the idea is in the year in the pre-clerkship years, we're no longer calling them years one and two because it makes no sense to do that. We're having to think about what we're going to call them. You will as well. I think we're calling it pre-clerkship years uh, if we're going to end early. What's that? Pre-clinical. Pre-clinical, right, yeah. Uh, 
So we're really talking, as I said earlier, about data and uh, these other areas, classic areas of biomedical informatics are covered, but not necessarily in depth. And then uh, year two, really looking at clinical decision making, clinical decision support. So year two, we retained the one week block because it was, it's remained a really cool block. It's gonna be now merged with a scholarly project and a capstone activity. So it'll actually become part of a three week block, which actually is kind of helpful. But briefly, in that week, what we do is we get them for a whole week, right? So we close the doors. Uh, we, on Monday, really talk about decision making. And, and we give them a little quiz at the beginning. The first, first thing they get is a little quiz, which is anonymous. And we give them a bunch of clinical questions just to answer these as best you can. Of course, it's a trick, right? There's an A quiz and a B quiz. And they're framed differently. So we, we elicit framing biases and other classic decision biases. Then as the day progresses, we've compiled their data. We talk about clinical decisions and we talk about data. And then at the end of the day, we do the heuristics and bias talk where they actually see the results of their, their decision, right? Because it's always the other guy that makes the crappy decision, never me. But it's usually pretty humbling for the students when they realize they, as a group collectively, have demonstrated exactly the biases that are reported in the literature. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are uh, Dungeon Learning Studios where we give them uh, when we had fewer students, we gave them one clinical scenario. Now that we're giving them five, so we have 10 groups, eight students each, and two groups each top each of the five topics. And they have to do, uh, using triage software, which is commercially available decision analysis software, often used for finance. Uh, they have to learn to use the software, which uh, I'll talk about in a second. Then they create decision analysis trees for these different conditions. They have to determine terminal utilities and uh, for the terminal utilities that are cost-based, it's real easy because it's like, okay, we did this test and we did this treatment, so that's, this is the cost. They also have to do patient-based terminal utilities, which are different. So from a patient's perspective, if I get a false negative on my H. pylori test and I go on to get gastric cancer, what's the negative utility? So it turns out that negative utility is quite high, even though it's a low probability, you know, you starts to bubble through and you get a different, you actually get different, often these trees flip. And you get a different recommendation when you're looking at patient utility. So what do we do? We bring in the behavioral science person, right? Because we're doing these theme fusion jazz things. And she starts to then teach them how do you interview patients to elicit their values so that you can better make decisions that are coherent with their, their values. It's really pretty cool exercise. A lot of energy in the room, students get into it. We actually, as I mentioned, I was going to come back to the software. We didn't want to do this for the software because we had the tree, we had them doing the trees, just drawing them out the first year, because we thought the software would get in the way, it'd be drag, you know. And in the first year, we had 24 students, so we had four groups of six. So I'm walking around, all of a sudden, I see one of the groups is using triage, and then I'm walking around and I see all the groups are using triage. And it turned out one of the students was a, had a PhD where he'd used triage in his lab, so he started his group using it within about a half an hour, it spread to all the other groups. And they were already self-trained and using it by the time we figured out what was going on. So we just buy them licenses now. It's really pretty cool. So uh, kudos to the students for teaching us. So uh, then getting into year three, looking at point of care decision support. Uh, we used to teach this early in terms of sequencing. What we got feedback is that the students said, eh, I'd rather dip that. I, I can use Hippocrates, I'll use Dynamet, but I wanna, when I get ready for clerkships, then we get into a little bit more depth on point of care tools. Specific tools, uh, ones that are licensed by our university or our campus, and then also a little bit about how to assess and evaluate those kinds of tools. Um, quality issues I mentioned earlier, we do a variety of workshops in the fourth year intercession, so about e-prescribing. You wanna get more into patient portals and also fit data, predictive modeling, you know, the whole idea of that data exchange that we always hope is just right over the horizon. So uh, we have about five minutes left. I'd be happy to field any other questions, comments. Have you ever dragged back any of your graduates to ask them what worked or what didn't work? Have we dragged back graduates? No. I would love to drag back graduates, but our, our oldest graduate is finishing residency right now, three-year residency. So I would love to get them in about five to ten years practice for a while. But the problem with all of these, this is a joke that Sumi and I have, every year is radically different, especially in the early years, because you're changing it. So you're always tweaking your stuff if, you're, if you care about teaching, but the rate of change in the first couple of years was significant. So I, in my head, had four different sequences of informatics. 
I'd remember this class got this, this, and this, but not that. So I had to be sure that I got that for this class. It's crazy. And I had it in my head, and I could articulate it, but anybody else found it a bizarre conversation. So the problem is, until we, we never thought we could really assess long-range impact of the curriculum until it's stabilized. And as you can see, it's continuing to change. So it's kind of hard to know where to take the sample. Uh, I think another aspect of that is maybe you could ask them sort of what they are using in terms of knowledge, because you may be able to ask that independent of what the curriculum is between years. Right. I would love to have that opportunity. Yeah. And I'm, I'm saying that because getting to these people is really difficult. And getting, even when they were our students, to get them to fill out a questionnaire was quite difficult. Uh, and even when you bribe them in various ways, the only time we've actually been able to get good responses is when we lock them in a room and won't let them leave until they do it, which is what we're doing now with some of our students. We have, like, once a month is, like, assessment day, and we buy them food, and they have to stay for the full hour and complete their evaluation. So it's logistically challenging, but it's a great point. It's a great point. And I always am aiming for 10 years from now. I'm aiming for that student to come back to me and say, that stuff that we thought was, I was saying, I had this happen, that stuff we thought was nonsense turns out to be that's what I'm hoping to hear in a couple of years. Yeah. Well, generally in informatics, I think it was none. Slim. I don't know if you have a different perspective, but not not very well penetrated and relative to the EHR skills, not. I mean, I've asked all over Phoenix, and there is no shop that's teaching relationship skills as part of their basic EHR training. Although I was asked by the LA Regional Extension Center to come out and work with a group of physicians, and I generally don't like to do like road shows, but I was fascinated to see if the methodology would work for practicing physicians or if it would be considered irrelevant. And it was even more compelling for the practicing physicians they knew there was a problem in the way that they were relating to patients with EHR, but they didn't know what to do about it. And just like with the residents I described earlier, here's someone that figured out some really cool things to do. Here's someone that can't figure it out at all. Can you guys get together? Uh, so, so I think more of this needs to you know, be out there uh, for practicing physicians as well. But there is no real easy vehicle. I mean, you, you have your courses here, but that's a, that's a small subset of the practice. And frankly, even if we say 10 years from now it's going to be any better, I doubt it, unless more medical schools start teaching this or residencies integrated into their curriculum. I just have a comment about using decision analysis software. Uh, we use triage for a course I co teach for MBA students. And it's really interesting to see how they react to this concept of, of doing decision analysis on the fly. And every year we do the course, I always think there's got to be some way we can incorporate this into the student curriculum and into residency curriculum. Um, once you had these students who started using triage, did you have trouble or difficulties in selling the concept of using the software to subsequent batches where you didn't have a PhD student who was coming through? Well, guess who the triage expert is? Which was, let me tell you, on the job, let's go into learning. So, so we actually, all, we buy a 30-day student license. They're $25 for each group. And after 30 days, it sunsets and it's done. I have had a couple students come back who are doing it. One in particular who's doing a scholarly project in a very clever way wanted to use decision analysis for that. But one of the things we, we stress during that Monday opening of that week is that you're not going to use decision analysis in practice. It's more likely if you're in public health or you're setting policy guidelines, you might do that kind of stuff. You're not going to run a decision analysis. It's more the concept that there are structured ways to incorporate new information into decision making. You know, so it may inform, say, a evidence-based guideline, or it may inform a, a rule in a, a clinical solution support structure. But uh, it's going to be precious few that are actually going to sit down and make formal analysis. But it's intriguing for them because all of a sudden they realize um, there is a structural way to do this. That this is not just such and such told me that I should do it this way. The other thing is it's a really good refresher for uh, sensitivity and specificity in two-by-two two tables. And they have to really understand that or they're going to get balled up. So, so it, it, there's some ancillary benefit in other ways. That's where, again, public health people love us because we're reinforcing sensitivity and specificity. Do it. Let's go do it again. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm 
any other comments? Yeah. So I'm going to thank you. I have one last oh, one. Yeah, please. Please. As a practicing physician, so before, you know, 10 years before, we all graduated 10 years ago, we didn't have any of these electronic health records. And, you know, when I started practicing, we, we had a computer. We had to dial in to, you know, get on the internet, right? So we are almost illiterate uh, at my age. And so what we are looking forward to is kind of these developments which can be incorporated and do this job automatically. Yeah, exactly. That, that is what we are looking for. And obviously, we'll have the background knowledge, but having that, okay, you calculate the Birmingham criteria, for example. You got all the elements in the medical record. Why can't this computer calculate it for me? Why I have to go and put all these things in? when there is already in the background, in the database, all these things are available. Yeah, in fact, well, my fantasy is to go to my doctor's office and not have to write my address 18 times. But So we, we, we know it's possible. In some cases, there may be technical restrictions, but uh, so much of it has to do with the work that Bill and his group are doing here. If clinicians are, are better informed, even if it's a subset about what's possible, like I always define informatics as the, as the Venn intersection between what's possible and what's useful. So the informaticians understand what's possible. The engineers understand what's possible. When I was at MIT, believe me, hacking in and getting your phone bill deleted was really cool. Actually, I suppose it was useful, too. <laughs> but um, you know, so we need more people that can, can see that intersection and give clinicians, and I, you know, I say this broadly, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, everybody, give clinicians kind of a, a voice into these implementations. And, and we already know from literature that implementations tend to not go well when clinicians are not meaningfully involved. So, so it, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a master's or a PhD. What we're, and this is where I'd love to see what actually comes out of this in 10 years. But I think we probably, I'm hoping we have our medical students knowledgeable enough and empowered enough, not that they're going to go re-engineer a system, but they're going to know, wait a second, there's a better way to do it. And then say to the engineers, here's what I need. Can you do this? And they just go, yeah, sure, we can do that. Thank you, doctor. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate your comments.